talk about Jasmine Harton. And we got some great video. We're really back in a wheelhouse because we've got somebody who's being accused of something and they're swearing up and down they didn't do it. And nobody knows for sure yet, or she's not being convicted of anything yet. And uh, the problem with the video is this, just so you know, from our point of view, it, it's edited horrifically for what we want to do. For TV, man, it's perfect. It's great. But we're missing after a peers asks a question, quite often they cut off that first one, two seconds of the pause, and we miss that initial punch of the question, how it hits them and how they react. And there's a lot of that going on in there. So other than that, it's it's great. It's clean, just like we like it. We can hear everything good. We can see everything really good. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to yeah, watch? We're, there's not a lot to add to that. This is Jasmine Harton. She happens to be the daughter-in-law of one of the most powerful people in the UK, who is the deputy chair of the Conservative Party, if I remember correctly. Mark, you can correct me. Yeah. And her... She's from she's is the common law wife of a billionaire and they live in Belize. She was sitting on a dock with a police supervisor and somehow or other. And we'll listen to all the details. He ended up with a bullet hole behind his ear and dead in the water. We'll leave it at that and we'll go from there. And we've got a we've got a guest sitting there with Greg, who's who's one of our favorites all around. Jim Pyle. Say hi, Jim. Stick your head in. Hey, guys. Good to see you. There he is. Yeah, well, hey, man. I'm in DC this week and I'm hanging out with Jim. We get a few minutes to hang out and talk. So he's going to be here with us. Awesome. Here we go. I want to take you to life before this incident. What was your life like in Belize at the time? Before this accident, it was exciting. I had my children. Um, Andrew and I had just opened Alaya Hotel. Uh, it had only been open for a few weeks. And we were still ironing out the wrinkles of the hotel. Um, it was an exciting time. Um, we were looking forward to the future. I've read varying reports about the status of your relationship with Andrew Ashcroft. Can you clarify whether it was happy at the time or whether you'd had problems? Andrew and I had a lot of issues in our relationship, um, specifically the last year and a half. We were sleeping separately. We were keeping appearances together. Andrew's family thought that we were still very much an item. My children didn't know that we were sleeping separately. We kept it very hidden from them as well. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is going to be a great, this entire show is going to be a great one around eye accessing, because I'm going to tell you that if you think you know eye accessing and you're wrong, you'll, you'll really screw the pooch on this one. This will be a hard one for most folks. We're going to see a lot of fight or flight in her right here in the beginning, but it's not pronounced. And there's lots of reasons for people to have fight or flight, not only because you're afraid you're going to be busted, but because it's a hard question. So let's just start with that and say, she says, after she says exciting, she pauses and goes to, um, that means she's thinking. She looks down into her right. We associate looking down into your right with emotional eye accessing. Then there's this other part. We were looking and she pauses very forward to the future. Her voice lilts up for one of the few times you're going to hear at the end of this. She raises both shoulders and does an intake breath that shows some uncertainty. There's when you start to see all the fight or flight. Eye blocking and nodding at the time he's asking a question means she's preparing. There's a lip compression to contain. Her breathing rate increases. She swallows heavily twice and she has kind of a stiff neck. That doesn't mean she's ready to turn over or do anything. It just means there's where she's going. As she starts to answer this question, she opens her eyes wide, and then she goes back down to that down right. Now, there's one interesting piece. As they're asking her questions that she goes to eye accessing cues for memory, very clearly she goes to her right above her brow ridge. And we associate above your brow ridge with visual. In this case, that's her visual memory. When she goes back to left, it's how to characterize what she's saying. And people that don't understand that are going to really make a mistake here, so pay attention. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll do is her voice, when she says, we had problems, look at that brow up. That's an understatement, just about guarantee you. We see a pattern of, of, of really calm under pressure, and I think this is just her answering the questions, even though she knows they're going to be tough. Now, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you, especially with the eye accessing. People are going to have a hard time uh, if, if they're not well-versed in this. Right when she says, uh, before this accident, we see what we typically call emotional accessing. She's looking down and to her right. And uh, when she says it was exciting, there's a single shoulder shrug, which typically means somebody might lack confidence in something that they're saying. doesn't always mean deception. 
And when she says they're looking forward to the future, there's there's two single shrugs on both shoulders. And I think we're going to see that several times where the shoulders go up one at a time, which is very interesting. It's something we don't see very often. When she's talking about her relationship with Andrew, who is her common law husband, there's target pulling uh, away a little bit of target pulling and kind of tightening the eyes to look at the other person. But finally, there's lip retraction. And when the lips go into the mouth, especially throughout this interview, a couple more videos, you're going to see this happen a few more times. Lips go into the mouth or an object, the end of a pencil, a person's finger, a woman puts her hair into her mouth. This typically denotes or indicates that there's a need for reassurance taking place here. So it's happening here at this key moment when she's talking about this relationship, which is going to come up again uh, in the near future. Scott, what do you got? All right, we see a bad edit right out of the gate. When she said, uh, right before that, you can still hear the room sound where she said something else. I don't know what it is, but that room's got a, got a, an echo in it or what's called room sound. And you can still hear the last part of that word before she starts talking, um, especially right before she says, before this accident. That's when we start hearing that. The stressed mouth and disappearing lips that she exhibits when uh, Pierre says her husband really stands out. You're right, Chase. That, that's a big deal there. But I don't really... Uh, interpret that as lip compression as uh, the lips actually disappear. So I'm going to call that stress mouth. That's what I, that's what I've turned that as. So she also uh, flares her nostrils a little bit, which says she's really paying attention, really preparing for, for, um, for this answer because she's really in the heat here. There's a lot of pressure for her. It's really good. Um, another nostril flare. Oh, we won't talk about that one. Um, I'm not seeing any deception in here so far. Everything looks really good. And um, we're just seeing psychological discomfort, I think. And that's because of the subject they're talking about. It's the first question. And, and right out of the gate, she's just showing what Joe Navarro refers to as psychological um, discomfort. And so those are all the cues we're seeing at this point. Uh, but then again, keep in mind, because here right out of the gate, we're seeing that the missing beginning of the answer. So it's really we're missing a lot there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so a lot missing here because of the editing. I'll talk about that right at the end, I think. But th there is a moment here and throughout where we get what we call in TV a double header in that there are two heads at the same time. And I don't think they've been edited out of sync. So we are seeing her reaction to a question being asked. Uh, various reports of status of relationship. And on that, we get a swallow, we get that movement with the lips, the lip tightening, we get a slow blink. So I would say, really reiterating what's been said there, you've got stress, very certainly. You've got more stress with the lips. You maybe even have a little bit of withheld opinion there. But with the slow blink, you've got acceptance. And I think it's acceptance at starting the questioning at that level, that actually Piers has come in pretty hard on this one immediately. He's going to continue like that because that's why he has the job that he has. Again, talk about all of that a little bit later on. But I'd say, yeah, it's it's kind of a baseline, I would say, of how she's handling in actually a very composed manner, generally, this level of stress. Quite interesting. That's all I got on that one. I want to take you to life before this incident. What was your life like in Belize at the time? Before this accident, it was exciting. I had my children, um, Andrew and I had just opened Alaya Hotel. Uh, it had only been open for a few weeks. Um, we were still ironing out the wrinkles of the hotel. Um, it was an exciting time. Um, we were looking forward to the future. I've read varying reports about the status of your relationship with Andrew Ashcroft. Can you clarify whether it was happy at the time or whether you'd had problems? Andrew and I had a lot of issues in our relationship, um, specifically the last year and a half. We were sleeping separately. We were keeping appearances together. Andrew's family thought that we were still very much an item. My children didn't know that we were sleeping separately. We kept it very hidden from them as well. You see, just listening to what you've just said in response to two questions, there's an immediate contradiction, which maybe you can clear up. But when I asked you what life was like, you painted a fairly idyllic picture of a very happy existence with your family and your kids and so on. And when I asked you directly about the status of your relationship, you paint a very different picture. 
And so people who are your critics, as you know, they keep leaping on what they see as apparent inconsistencies in your public statements. I can clarify that very easily. I was very excited to split up from Andrew. Uh, I was excited that Elia had opened. Um, I was happy to be with my children, happy to, for the future, like I said. Um, I had already been emotionally done with Andrew for, for a long time, a year and a half, almost two years. So the prospect of being able to move on with my life and stop pretending to be in a relationship with him, that was exciting to me. So Aliyah had just opened, we were about to come out to the family that we weren't together and I was actually going to get my freedom. So when I say I, I, it was happy, positive times, it was. I was excited to have my freedom and to be able to move on with my life apart from Andrew. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, there's some contempt here, right? When she's talking about incongruencies or inconsistencies, I'm, I can't remember which word it was, but she said I could clear that up easily. There's an eye movement shift from her baseline to nine o'clock, uh, which is different. So all we're looking for is, oh, that's different. That's a, that's a marker we should be looking at. There's some hesitancy here. And there's this this double shoulder shrug again, where there's kind of a wave of of shoulder shrugs. Maybe we call that a shoulder wave. Maybe there's a word for it that I don't know. Uh, when she says emotionally done with Andrew for two years, as she's describing this, this is where we see a drop in her fluency. So we see perfect fluency, and then there's a sudden drop in the ability of her uh, to be produce fluent language, like I'm having trouble with right now. Then there's different accessing. Talking about Andrew is back at 11 o'clock and talking about the kids is emotional. More around as you're looking at her on this video, it's going to be seven o'clock. And there's the repetitive uh, single shrugs there about the kids as well. And the prospect of being able to move on with my life, looking to the future. There's one o'clock accessing, which I think Greg was referring to earlier. And I agree. This is how is this going to sound? How how will this best sound to people? What you saying? I'm excited to move on with my life. We see some more shoulder shrugs, baton gestures. When we do this while we're talking, this is a Desmond Morris phrase, this baton gesture phrase. Uh, they're all on point. They all match up. There's an increase in fluency, and she's still comfortable using Andrew's name, which is a big deal that there's some comfort using a person's name. Don't see a lot of deception here at all. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, overall, I agree. It's congruent messaging, and I, I won't hit all the same points you've hit, but let's hit a couple of things. Her blink rate does go up, in fact. And that blink rate goes up because she is in her acceptance of the attack or what I call an intake mode. That slight smile, maybe a little contempt, short head nods, and the pursing of her lips that look kind of like disapproval, all of that is because she's sitting on intake and taking whatever is coming, and she expects it. She's prepared to answer, and she's there to weather the storm. This is kind of a putting on a brave face, if you think of it that way, mindset, to get the data before you start to respond. But when she starts to talk, she does that downward intonation, Mark, you talk about in the telling fashion. There's no lilting. There's no, no, this is how it is. She's downward telling. And her brow actually goes down and is tense. At, I've been done with him for years. Here's one of my favorite things that you don't see often. People have a dominant eye. We all, everybody who shoots know what, knows what their dominant eye is. But one of your eyes is better for intake, better for shooting, better for all that. And if you watch her left eye, it is shrinking. That doesn't mean she's lying. That means this is unpleasant material for her and she's trying to escape it. Now, we do see it in liars, too. Occasionally, when they're really stressed and they're trying to get away from something and they close to get out and it's not conscious, your eye just is closing. Watch her. We'll see it happen through here when she's in stressful moments. Um, there's also a left. You, we, you said it earlier. When she looks to her left and up, what she's doing is how do I characterize this? Because you want to make sure you put the best face on whatever it is you're going to say. And then there's a long vowel in so. So she goes, so. For a long time, a year and a half, almost two years. So. That's her thinking. That's her giving herself a chance to come up with the right details to say the right thing. This is important when you interview somebody and they use a long vowel. That means they're having time to think because she's not using it anywhere else. It gives us an indicator for where to look for where she is navigating language. And that's a good place for you when you're interviewing a person to pay attention as well. Scott, what do you got? So I think what we're seeing is Duper's, Duper's delight there, because when she's being called out on saying how wonderful things are, 
uh, things were, they weren't, you know, and she, and so she's getting, she's not busted for that, but he's talking about that. So that's why we're seeing that because she's busted on pretending they were right. So I'm not really seeing any deception there because she's sort of being honest about that at that point. But I think she's thinking about being deceptive when it was going on. And that's what we're seeing. Um, then we see classic lip pursing and that suggests he doesn't, uh, doesn't agree with what he's saying, which makes sense at this point. And that long eye blink after she, after he, um, talks about her critics. I don't think that's a, that's a block. I think that's more of a, a confirmation of what she's saying. She's like, yes, which people will quite often do. They'll, they'll confuse the head nod. Uh, no, when they're actually saying yes, if it's a slight head nod, that's when you can usually count on it as being uh, not being what it's supposed to be. But when you see that a hard a shake, no, as they're confirming something, that's what I look at as a, as a confirmation. No, even though they're saying yes, I know it sounds odd, but pay attention to that and you'll see. Uh, I think she knows about all the bad talk and that's why she's smiling as well. Just that's what helps her deal with it. All right, I'm having some editing problems. So to get past that, let's go ahead and move on to Mark. Okay, so um, lots of eyebrow acceptance in there. Uh, now, is that a look for approval? I don't think it is. I think it's simply this idea of, I want you to accept this. We've got to now move on. I think she's constantly got this attitude, and it could be a baseline attitude in her personality that's constantly going, well, this is the way things are. You've got to move on. Could be that, but I think if it is that, it's also this situation as well. Uh, she actually says, uh, you know, that's the way it was. Um, so I think her premise here is that we need to accept that. We're seeing that in her face. I think we're seeing that in the double shoulder shrug. I agree there's some kind of weird waves there. and We will get some single shoulder shrugs later on. But I think the double shoulder shrug is like is like that emoji of, look, what are you going to do? This is just the way it was. We need to move on from this. Now, the interesting thing about being interviewed here by Piers Morgan is the one thing he's renowned for is never moving on. He's a dog with a rag all the time. And so what you're going to see is him coming back to stuff and coming back to stuff. It's th for that type of personality where she wants things to move on or the situation where she wants to move it on, it's going to be a harsh video, a uh, harsh interview for her. You see, just listening to what you've just said in response to two questions, there's an immediate contradiction, which maybe you can clear up. But when I asked you what life was like, you painted a fairly idyllic picture of a very happy existence with your family and your kids and so on. And when I asked you directly about the status of your relationship, you paint a very different picture. And so people who are your critics, as you know, they keep leaping on what they see as apparent inconsistencies in your public statements. I can clarify that very easily. I was very excited to split up from Andrew. Uh, I was excited that Alaya had opened. Um, I was happy to be with my children, happy to, for the future, like I said. Um, I had already been emotionally done with Andrew for, for a long time, a year and a half, almost two years. So the prospect of being able to move on with my life and stop pretending to be in a relationship with him, that was exciting to me. So. Aliyah had just opened. We were about to come out to the family that we weren't together, and I was actually going to get my freedom. So when I say I, I, it was happy, positive times, it was. I was excited to have my freedom and to be able to move on with my life a, apart from Andrew. The reason I've, I've asked about relationship is simply, as you know, Belize has been agog with rumours that you were having some kind of other relationship with Henry Jemot. That's why you were out on this jetty late at night by the ocean. That's why you were partying together. What do you say to those rumors? Well, first of all, I met Henry through Andrew. Andrew was friends with Henry. So Andrew was meant to come with us um, and join us for a cocktail that night. The last minute he decided to stay in and not join us. Um, it was also supposed to be another friend joining us uh, as well. Henry had his friends staying at the same unit. So we weren't meant to be by ourselves. That just happened to be that way. Um, we also weren't partying. Uh, I grabbed a glass or a bottle of wine that had been opened before, and I brought that with me. I had maybe two glasses of wine. So it wasn't a party. Um, 
And yeah, the rumors of, of Henry and I, that's completely false. We were friends. I knew him through Andrew. And it's just a small country with a rumor mill and they like to make something of a story that it's not. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's concentrate on Piers for a bit because it's double header. You can see his response to her story. And there's just such a lot of work in his lips. Uh, pursed lips there as well, which uh, gives us the sense that he's not in agreement with the story being told. Uh, a lot of the lips disappearing, being retracted or being stretched out in some way, withholding opinion, shutting himself down, trying not to get in, you know, kind of butt in on it, which is one of the ways that he traditionally interviews people. So he's having to hold himself down here, but certainly he's not buying it. Well, is that because uh, it's not a buyable story or is it because it's not his job at the moment or the job that he might have been given to to buy this? Um, both things are, are, are possible uh, here. Um, look, no, the whole story here, that, you know, I, I was only there because it can't be a relationship because it's a friend of my husband's. Well, that's how it starts. I mean, that's, you know, look, it's like anything. It's always going to be somebody in the family, the next door neighbor, always look closest, first of all, before you ever look further away. Though, of course, there are massive outliers to that and, and, and many stories around that. But, you know, saying, look, it's too close to home for it to be a relationship um, is, is not credible uh, at all. But anyway, interesting to see Pierce's response there, which could be one that is accurate, he doesn't believe her, or that's not his job right now to believe her. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm going to be real short on this one. <clears throat> she starts off with amusement. And I, the way you can pick up amusement is a person's eyes are smiling and their mouth is contained. That's usually where you see amusement. The center of the face is happy. The eyes are happy. The mouth is not yet curled. So she is containing something there. And she does rationalize, which makes you think, oh, oh something's wrong. Here comes a lie because she does that rationalizing. It can't be just as you said, almost every, every affair is with somebody you knew. That's the way it works. So I, that makes you immediately jump off there. But let me tell you why I don't think anything was going on. If you are a guy and you are talking to a woman and she said, and she's telling you, oh yeah, yeah. I think you're attractive and, 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 but the tips of her brows come up. That's pity. That's pity. Turn around. You're done. Just leave that alone. And just walk away from it. It can also indicate sorrow, but it looks like pity to me here in this case. And it flashes through her face. I don't think there was anything going on. Now, I will talk more later about what could have happened. But do I think they're having an affair based on this? No, I don't seem that. Um, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you all. Uh, when they're talking about partying on the pier, I want you to watch this very closely. She conceals a smile before she allows another smile to appear here. It's very brief, it's very minimal, but I think it's important to note, and I'm, we're, none of us are psychic, uh, as far as I know. Let me know in the comments down here what you think this smile means. We've got a replay here on the screen. And when she says Andrew was meant to come with us for a cocktail, there's a sharp increase in blink rate, but only for this topic. And the shoulders start going crazy throughout the clip. This behavior is becoming repetitive. The shoulder movement behavior is becoming repetitive. So guess what we're going to do as behavior profilers? We see repetitive behavior. We often ignore it because it is now some baseline thing that's just going to come up all the time. When she's saying it wasn't a party, uh, she had a bottle of wine after two glasses of wine, uh, but we didn't bring the bottle out to drink. It had been opened before by some other person for some other purpose. It was already open. So this is kind of couching. I want to know what our definition of party is. Uh, is it different than maybe a prince that we've done uh, an analysis on? And how would it differ from what she thinks Pierce Morgan is insinuating here? And when she's saying the rumors of Henry and I, there's a lack of description. There's no no description like the rumors about us being x or the rumor about x this lack of description could point to something that i'm that might be psychological distancing i'm separating myself from the rumors i'm not going to talk about them but she shifts from talking about rumors plural to that's completely false so she pluralizes the rumors to make the attack against her but then she talks about a singular thing being false so 
right right when she's saying make something of a story that it's not uh there's a strong upward shift in blink rate to about 55 per minute and just keep in mind human average is around 15 to 20 a minute give or take her overall defense is that if a husband introduces someone to his wife then there's no possible way an affair could happen and i think there's a lot of dudes and a lot of women that could uh, uh counter that but not a whole lot of deception here. Not a lot of deception that I've seen here. Scott? Yeah, I'm with you. And at the beginning, that blink rate is low because she's making sure she's catching it. Everything he's saying as it, com- as, as it comes out, she wants to miss nothing on that. And you're right, Mark. He's trying to. He's trying so hard not to say anything. He's trying to keep it under, under control. He's squishing around his lips, person, everything, because he's got these questions. He's loaded for a bear and get ready to sting her with those, and he can't wait because that's the way he usually is anyway. Her vocal pitch and, and, and tone are strong, and her cadence is fairly normal for her bass line. And I'm not seeing anything that's uh, here that's stress-worthy to talk about at that point. Um, let's see. The uhs have increased some. The, the uhs, because in between when she talks, she wants to make sure she gets in. If, she's, if this is a sentence, there's a space. This is a sentence. She puts that uh in there to make sure he doesn't jump in, because I think she can tell he's wanting to say other stuff in there. Um, her illustrators are almost non-existent at this point, except for those shoulder shrugs. But I do think she is illustrating with that uh, head shake no to emphasize what she's saying. I think that's what she's using as illustrators. No hands or, or anything, just pretty much her head in that and the no. All right, we good? The reason I've, I've asked about a relationship is simply, as you know, Belize has been agog with rumors that you were having some kind of other relationship with Henry Jemot. That's why you were out on this jetty late at night by the ocean. That's why you were partying together. What do you say to those rumors? Well, first of all, I met Henry through Andrew. Andrew was friends with Henry. So Andrew was meant to come with us um, and join us for a cocktail that night. Last minute, he decided to stay in and not join us. Um, It was also supposed to be another friend joining us. Uh, as well, Henry had his friends staying at the same unit. So we weren't meant to be by ourselves. That just happened to be that way. Um, we also weren't partying. Uh, I grabbed a glass or a bottle of wine that had been opened before, and I brought that with me. I had maybe two glasses of wine. So it wasn't a party. Um, and yeah, the rumors of, of Henry and I, that's completely false. We were friends. I knew him through Andrew, and it's just a small country with a rumor mill, and they like to make something of a story that it's not. Part of the, part of the narrative, as you know, um, from people who clearly uh, don't like you, but they've painted, again, a picture of quite a wild socialite party girl. There are videos of you sort of dancing in the rafters of restaurants and so on, that you were heavily into cocaine abuse uh, and drinking heavily. Uh, I know you've refuted those, but why, do, why are people going around saying this kind of stuff? I've wondered the same thing. The only thing I can come to think of is who would benefit from such rumors. Um, obviously, it would benefit in a custody course. It would benefit in many ways if I'm per- perceived to be this wild cocaine addict party girl. Um, it's just not true. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be quick on this one, too. Here she goes again with this intake face, with that light smile as she's sitting braced for whatever's coming. She knows something's coming and you see contempt, but she's smart enough to cover that contempt fairly quickly with a smile. She does fidget in the chair. So she knows this is going to be something where they're poking on her pretty hard. She probably knows that video or that picture is there. So her respiration increases again. Remember, we talk about fight or flight. And a fight or flight doesn't mean I do something. It means I'm prepared to do something. I may sit dead still and not do anything, dependent on how much inoculation to stress I've had. The less you've had, the more likely you are to react and move around. She, this is the most movement we've seen from her. So again, nothing out of place here that contained that contained um, contempt and then a light smile. She's just an intake face and taking it like like a champ. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So. Um... What I want you to look at is her composure in the video versus climbing those rafters and the words being said not only by peers, but by her wild socialite cocaine party girl. When those words are said either by peers 
or by her repeating and refuting what he says, that's the moment where this show plays that specific video. But they've painted, again, a picture of quite a wild socialite party girl. There are videos of you sort of dancing in the rafters of restaurants and so on. It would benefit in many ways if I'm per perceived to be this wild cocaine addict party girl. Um, it's just not true. And yet you have this person who's very, very composed. I think it's fair to say that she's under stress here, but there's a lot of composure. And now we're going to go to somebody climbing in the rafters and say the words wild, socialite, cocaine and party girl. Only when those words are said. That's been edited in in the moment or afterwards. The vision mixer has gone for it at exactly that point. Now, what I now want you to do is go back and look at her and what she's actually doing. She's climbing onto a saddle, which is placed on a rafter that juts out. It's clearly placed there so you can go to that point and sit on that saddle. Have a look at a movement. Is that the movement of somebody climbing onto a saddle high up who's had a lot of alcohol, like a lot of alcohol, or some alcohol, or maybe just a bit, or maybe none at all? I don't see somebody who is blind party drunk climbing into that saddle. Her movement's too ordered, too good. And here's the clincher for me. She sits down on the saddle and then she just adjusts with her, with her thumb and finger her skirt to make sure it is in a more modest position, just a tiny bit to go, I better look okay. That's not somebody who's, yeah, somebody having a good time, but but probably doing something that many, many people do when they go to that bar or they go to that restaurant. I think this is an activity that happens quite a lot there. Could be wrong, but that's my judgment about that one. And it's interesting, the, the words that are put with that particular piece of vision. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Couldn't agree more. Right at the mention of severe or heavy cocaine abuse, the, the words are a little bit much. I think they're much for her. And you can see contempt start to come on the face, but it's not contempt for display. Contempt for display is a lot more powerful and uses a lot more muscles. Then the head begins to shake. No. So she feels the emotion first and then starts doing the no shaking, which is for display, which is meant to signal to another person. There's a lack of denial, but she redirects to the opposition here about the, the things that are against her, the people against her. There's downward head movement, which is a little bit out of her baseline. because I think she is portraying something. She probably has used Coke. She's probably done uh, other drugs. She's probably drank before. Uh, but the head baton movements are very slightly out of her baseline. When it's when this thing is coming up, like Mark saw, talked about, this wild cocaine addict party girl, she's saying it's just not true. Well, I'm wondering which part of the description, because we can deny something. If one part isn't true, it's psychologically less stressful for us when there's a piece of the story we can firmly deny. It's more comfortable. We show less deceptive indicators when there's a piece of it that we can deny. So when there's a wild accusation, even though we did part of it, it's psychologically easier for us to deny. So the perception piece, along with the who would this benefit piece are really well done. Uh, when she said, who would this benefit? You know, who is this going to benefit? Really well done, maybe by a legal advisor and legal team. But uh, the argument also fails to address who would benefit from it not being true, which is her. So she would benefit from a different story. They would benefit from a different story. Everybody's going to benefit from something. Uh, that's all I've got here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. I think what's interesting here throughout this so far at this point, we're not seeing what? Worry. She doesn't look worried or concerned about what she's talking about. She believes what she is saying. And that's so I, I tend to fall, fall right in with that. Because when, when he says, um, as part of the narrative, she adjusts in her seat and she gets ready for that. As he goes on to talk about the cocaine and the swinging from the rafters and all that stuff, we see her head go down. And we see that I think that's almost like a chin block for the neck. And quite often we'll see that when we're, we're um, 
seeing shame or someone feels guilt about something. So maybe she feels a little bit bad about doing that because she knows that she shouldn't be doing that. Whether she knew, knew they were going to use this video or not, who knows, but I'm sure she knows it's out there at this point. So I think, uh, I think we're seeing, like you were talking about earlier, Chase, a fantastic exhibition of just a little bit of contempt that little that little thing scoots out there on her mouth and you see just a just a touch of contempt there as he's talking about that it's it's not a, a micro expression because it shows up right after he says cocaine uh, abuse and she gives it a gives it a no shake so i think that's another way of her dealing with that going nah that's not right but but holding that in but she doesn't look worried so that's that's one thing that's that we'll talk about in a little while um we do see a, a couple of swallows with a little nostril flare after that, but they're not those big hard swallows like, okay, here we go. I've, I've got to remember everything I've said and everything I'm doing. She doesn't look like she's trying to remember what she said already. She doesn't look like she's worried about what she's getting ready to say. So I think that's that's really interesting in, with someone in this position. Um, and she's answering her, her questions. I think like you were saying, Mark, just everything's smooth and easy and just coming right out. Then look, she's loping along with these things. There's no stopping, no restructuring of anything. I don't think she sat down and thought all these out and is saying a, and, and just shooting off a, a structured answer for most of this. I think she's just flowing right along. So that I think she's at ease here almost, even though she's supposed to be on on point. I think she's at ease here. So I found that really interesting up to this point. All right, we good? Yeah, good. All right. Part of the, part of the narrative, as you know, um, from people who clearly uh, don't like you, but they've painted, again, a picture of quite a wild socialite party girl. There are videos of you sort of dancing in the rafters of restaurants and so on, that you were heavily into cocaine abuse uh, and drinking heavily. Uh, I know you've refuted those, but why, do, why are people going around saying this kind of stuff? I've wondered the same thing. The only thing I can come to think of is who would benefit from such rumors. Um, obviously, it would benefit in a custody course. It would benefit in many ways if I'm per perceived to be this wild cocaine addict party girl. Um, it's just not true. He goes and gets his gun and he brings it to the end of the dock. And then you start to play some sort of game with the magazine, with the bullets. What were you doing with them? Henry thought that it was important for me to get my firearms license because he thought I needed protection. So this is the second time he's had me handle his firearm. Um, the first time was on a few days prior to that um, when I called for help. I was in an uncomfortable situation and he had me handle his firearm that night. He said, get familiar with it. You should get your license. So then that night on the dock, he brought it out um, he handed me the clip of the gun and wanted me to practice unloading it, reloading it, just get comfortable just playing with the magazine and, and the ammunition. I'm just listening to this, obviously, cold from you, but it seems an odd thing to be doing at that time of night on the end of a dock on a starry night with just the two of you to be handling guns with live ammunition. I thought it was empty. Um, and I agree, it was a weird thing to do at that time, but I hadn't seen Henry during the day. If I did, he probably would have had me practice earlier in the day. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so biggest one for me is there is a clear look of disgust from her on the uncomfortable situation. I would say that uncomfortable situation that she's talking about is true. Yep. Something definitely happened. I don't know with who, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it definitely happened. I would want to know, hey, wh what is that? It, it, it may not even be pertinent at all to this story going on, but just to, it's very, very congruent that if there was an uncomfortable situation, it was, and that disgust, it was probably something way more than just uncomfortable. One last point on this, uh, Piers, that is a little bit naughty to put in uh, stock footage of a magazine being loaded up uh, out of nowhere. Um, it does, it's a bit incongruent with the fact that you have a live interview going on here. You, it happens in the script. We can do it in our own heads. So why... Why do you want to show us that right now? Why do we need to see that picture? What job is that image doing 
right now. Interesting. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. I think we're seeing a classic example of stress mouth when she talks about playing with a gun. And this goes right into, uh, he thought it was important for me to get my firearms license. So she, see, she knows something's up there. This whole thing's kind of squishy when you think about it. Um, her cadence has slowed down. Her diction becomes really clean and really clear as she's laying out this fairly clean and clear story. And then after she says, when I called for help, I was... There's a short pause and she she exhibits a large expression of anger. It's not a micro expression. It's just boom. There it is. So something something big must happen where she got really, really mad and she's not going to tell or give us any details. She talks about when she talked about learning to manipulate the magazine and the ammunition ammunition, but she puts it in amateur ter, in amateur terms, trying to get comfortable playing, playing with it. But she talks about playing with it. You know, they're playing with guns out there on the on the dock. You know, this is like one of the police chiefs or something. She's out there, got a gun. So that makes me think something's up. Um, and the night she shot him, for me, this is where all the bells and whistles are going off. Um, because what you want to know is, why did he leave his, his gun in the house? Why did he, when you go somewhere and you, and, you, and you carry, you don't take your gun off at your friend's house. You don't take your, your gun off at somebody's house and leave it somewhere in there, right? Unless you're doing something else. And he goes out to the dock and it makes sense because he went, oh, no, my gun's in the house. I got to go get it. You know, he's like, I, I shouldn't be doing it. He's a cop and he's out on a dock in the middle of the night. I think he's trying to impress her and say, oh, you know, you need to to have a gun and all that. And when she's playing, quote unquote, with the, the magazine, she keeps talking about a clip. Then she changes the magazine. So it goes back and forth to, to what she's heard during that. I'm sure he said magazine, but she remembers it as saying it always as clip. But the, the whole thing sounds kind of goofy up, up to this point. I got all kinds of bells and whistles going off. You, you, you would not take your gun off anywhere. anywhere. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't go to somebody's house and take it off. Police, especially a police officer, would not do that. It's like, ask one. No, and they'll say no. And I'll bet you $1,000, none of them have done that. You won't be able to find one that's taken his gun off or her gun off at somebody's house and left it in there and went walking around the yard or out on his dock somewhere. Not going to happen. So something's up. I think he's he's on the impression more is going to happen or she's giving him the impression more is going to happen uh, between them than actually is. So he goes back and gets it. And then he's trying to show it to her and stuff. It just it doesn't sound right here. Chase, what do you got? Yep. I tend to agree. When they're talking about this bringing the gun to the end of the dock, there's a lip retraction at a key point like we've seen before. Not compression, but retraction. The lips go into the mouth. This is typically a need for reassurance. She's comfortable using the victim's name here. And that's good points for her uh, of being honest. And she uses this one o'clock eye accessing, like Greg mentioned at, at the first video. And as we've kind of now established, she uses that when referencing timelines, especially with time-based memory and just retrieving. And when the, when the question or her answer revolves around any kind of timeline, and at this mention of in an uncomfortable situation or strong disgust or anger, uh, like Scott was saying on the face here, either way would pretty much mean the same to me. And then there's the starry night with just the two of you. The starry night is a little bit of a, a pitch to help you see it as some kind of romantic encounter. Who knows what the weather was? This is a little bit of a setup. So you can see the contempt on her face when he uses these words to describe the scene. And we're, she's unloading it and reloading it. And then she says, I thought it was empty. Then that night on the dock, he brought it out. Um, he handed me the clip of the gun and wanted me to practice unloading it, reloading it, just get comfortable, just playing with the magazine and, and the ammunition. I'm just listening to this, obviously, cold from you, but it seems an odd thing to be doing at that time of night on the end of a dock on a starry night with just the two of you to be handling guns with live ammunition. I thought it was empty. I'm unloading it and reloading it. And then I thought it was totally empty. Interesting because the blink rate at this point triples. So that we're that how often we blink is a stress indicator. Blink rate goes up threefold and the shoulders are kind of thrown upward. Then into the single shrugs, one after the other, just when talking about this, I thought, unloading, reloading, and I thought it was open. And her eye flutter movement 
shows up again when she's suggesting Henry would have had her practice earlier in the day. Don't know that she believes that as much as she wants us to believe it. Suggest she's not comfortable really making that statement. And if you want to sound like you're educated at all when it comes to guns, a clip is one of those little five bullet things where there's no, nothing around them that you might see in Saving Private Ryan, where they're jamming them down into the top of a, a weapon, where there's no magazine thing around it. It's just five bullets that are all kind of held together with a clip. You got it. And if it's a kind of a box that goes into a gun, that's a magazine. So they're very different. And I think there's a possibility. Don't know it for sure at all. There's a possibility she may be using the word clip on purpose to diminish our perception of her gun expertise. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm going to agree with both of you. It is disgust and it is anger. And I think the reason is because she's disgusted by the situation and quickly that changes to anger, I think, is what I saw. Because her face starts to shrink to the middle and then her jaw opens and shows those teeth is what I saw. And I think something happened. Don't know what that something was that she got really irritated about. And that anger is the, the residual whatever's left from it. When she's talking about that and when she's recalling the facts about what happened, watch her eyes. They're up to her right. And when I say up, I mean in visual above the brow ridge and up to her right. Every time she's talking about details about what happened, that starts to be very believable because Either she's some criminal mastermind who has rehearsed this so well that she goes up there every time she's thinking, or she's going to the same place when she's recalling data. That usually is a good indicator. I mean, most people don't even know that you can read eye movement, including body language. People don't believe it works half the time. So how, why would she plan to do that? It's question one. Um, at the beginning, if you notice, when the thing first starts, she, as she brings her hand up. Her face is very rigid, and now that one left eye is a lot smaller than the other. She's fed up with this situation, you can tell. She contains her emotion with that lip compression you're talking about, Scott, when she is talking about this weapon. And, guys, you know, is it odd to have a firearm out at the end of the dock on a starry night when you're sitting with a woman? Depends on where you're from. Depends on where you're from. Where I live, that might be considered date material. You might be showing off your new firearm. You never know. So don't, you know, don't try to read into it anything that, hey, the guy's a cop. He's got a gun. It's part of his life. It's just a part of his life. Would he bring out a gun and try to impress her? Possibly. Hey, yeah, look, here's what you should do. Could they just be talking about the gun? Sure. One of the more interesting things that happens, when, when that person does that narrowing of the eye, when you're interviewing somebody, you should wonder why their eye is narrowing. Now, some people do it all the time and their one eye is smaller. Other people, though, if you see that, pay attention to the person because they're, you're getting some rejection from that person when it's happening. The, the other thing she does that's really common is she shakes her head while inhaling. That's common in denial. When a person's truly denying, often you'll see them go, no, that's really common and it isn't, it's not a sign of deception. Um, and then I'll just leave it at that. That's plenty. Guys, I think you covered almost all of it. We can easily say, why would you have a firearm on the dock on a starry night? Well, it was a starry night. I'm a cop. I'm sitting on a dock. I probably got a firearm. That's just it. Now, the part, the last part I will do is this. When she's talking about loading the clip, the magazine, the whatever, thanks for giving those people a lesson to chase because I think it's important. But when you're loading a magazine, that doesn't load the pistol. And if you don't know anything about firearms, one of the scariest things in the world for a new gun person is an automatic pistol because you don't know how it works. You, you automatically think that when I stick the magazine in the well, it's loaded and it isn't. And if you don't know that, then you get confused. If, if you are a brand new gun owner, often it's easier to buy a revolver because they're like a cap gun. Every time you squeeze a trigger, something happens. And it's the reason a lot of people are scared of guns because they don't understand how they work. And I think that's not out of the norm for a person to say, hey, I put the bullets in the gun or in the magazine, and then he put it in the gun, so I thought it was loaded, or I didn't think it was loaded. That's confusing for people. I'll leave it at that. He goes and gets his gun, and he brings it to the end of the dock. And then you start to play some sort of game with the magazine, with the bullets. What were you doing with them? Henry thought that it was important for me to get my firearms license because he thought I needed protection. So this is the second time he's had me handle his firearm. Um, the first time was on a few days prior to that um, when I called for help. I was in an uncomfortable situation and he had me handle his firearm that night. He said, get familiar with it, you should get your license. 
So then that night on the dock, he brought it out. Um, he handed me the clip of the gun and wanted me to practice unloading it, reloading it, just get comfortable just playing with the magazine and, and the ammunition. I'm just listening to this, obviously, cold from you, but it seems an odd thing to be doing at that time of night on the end of a dock on a starry night with just the two of you to be handling guns with live ammunition. I thought it was empty. Um, and I agree, it was a weird thing to do at that time, but I hadn't seen Henry during the day. If I did, he probably would have had me practice earlier in the day. So Jasmine, you were playing around with the magazine and the bullets, but you yourself were not handling the gun, is that right? I was practicing unloading and reloading just the magazine. Um, the only time I handled the weapon was at the very end when Henry asked me to pass it to him. So he wanted me to pass him the clip, and at that point the clip was already back into the weapon. So I was struggling to remove the clip from the gun. Again, I wasn't handling the gun earlier, so I'm not familiar with the mechanisms, how to remove it. I didn't know if I was pressing the right button or not, um, because earlier he had handed me the clip, so I hadn't had to take it out before. Um, so I was struggling with it, and that's when the gun went off. All right, well, I'll go first on this one. Uh, this is it. Here it is. Any amateur uh, interrogator could take this apart and tell you exactly what happened here. They tell you the whole thing. He asked me to pass me the clip, but the clip was already in the weapon. Really? He wouldn't do that. He would. He, how would it already be in there? That means it's been stuck in there. She probably stuck it in there. He probably handed her the, the magazine. She was putting the bullets in and, and taking them out and practicing, rehearsing how to do that. And so then she stuck it in there. However, at some point, somebody had to rack that thing. So there's one in the pipe getting ready to go. And she doesn't know that. He may not know it either. But my question is, they're out on a dock. Again, here I am. They're out on a dock and they've been drinking. And he gives this woman his Glock. He gives her his Glock 19. She's behind him with that thing. And she's goofing around with it. What's got his attention? What's what's got him so focused that he's not paying attention to her? Is he looking at the at the starry night, as Piers was saying? Is he looking at at, a, at the Loch Ness monster? What what's going on here? What is he? What's got his focus where he's not paying attention to somebody who's drunk with his gun goofing around with it? And he can hear it back there because he's back there doing stuff and probably talking and putting it in, taking it out. And the button she's talking about is, is the, the button that ejects the, the magazine from the, from the bottom of the gun. And you just push that little button, but you have to have your finger out on the outside. Anybody you hand, a, you hand a pistol to who isn't used to handling a firearms, you give them the first thing they do is put their finger on the trigger. And it's, it's hair raising when you see that you go, ah, but you're ready for it because you know it's going to happen because it happens almost 100 percent of the time. You know, so I think what I think what happened was she was goofing around with this thing. And I don't think he said, hand me the magazine, hand me anything. I don't think he said, hand me the gun. I think she's down there rather goofing around with it, trying to get that thing back out so she can shove it back in and make that clicking sound. And when she does, she's got her finger on the trigger and she pushes down on the say on the, the release. So when she does, she squeezes like this because the button's right there and she squeezes and the gun goes off and hits him in the back of the head. That's what I think. So I think at this point, I think she's, we're, we're hearing a blend of the truth and a lie at that point so if she looks a little bit iffy in there i think that's why something's got his attention and i think his attention is on <laughs> hooking up with her at this point maybe she's leading him on maybe he's there for some reason he's on the impression he's there for something else and she's getting ready to ask him what it is or has already asked him or whatever but i think i think she accidentally shot him at this point i think it was an accident greg what do you got yeah, um, Mark, I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder and leave it for you after that. But if he didn't clear the weapon before she started all this, guys, alcohol involved with guns, no good. Nope. No good, no good. Been around guns my whole life. Last thing I want to do, even with a couple of drinks, is handle firearms. Because it's judgment and one minor mistake and somebody's hurt. I have a good friend, not any alcohol involved, not long ago, vaporized this bone in his hand with a nine millimeter just by making a minor mistake. So... If a minor mistake can do can kill you, which it can, I mean, three pounds of pressure in some cases with your finger can kill you. So what you got to be careful is not to make mistakes. If he didn't clear the pistol because he didn't think of it because he was distracted or some other reason, 
then it doesn't matter. You don't have to have a magazine in it and stuff could happen. So Mark, good question. So again, I want you to pay attention to her eye. That intake eye is pretty tight, but her, she is spot on in this one. Eye accessing is everything. She is spot on with visual memory. Every time they ask her a question and she recalls something visually, she's back up to that above the brow ridge on the right where she's gone every time for visual memory. She says, I was practicing unloading and reloading just the magazine. Probably true. Who cares? Whether I doubt, honestly, that a young woman who has not fired many pistols is going to rack the slide because she has no idea how that works. Just not. You don't go, hey, how does this work? That's just not. Usually that's when people put their finger on the trigger stupidly, too, is when they're doing that because it's comfortable for them. Um, but then she moves to emotional her, she does emotional eye accessing when she said, at the only time I handle the weapon, she goes down into a right. I think there is emotion associated with the fact she had an accidental discharge or did something stupid and caused a shot to kill a friend or somebody she knew, at least. Um, she's back up to visual memory again when you ask her questions. And the interesting pieces are no long vowels. Remember, we heard long vowels earlier. And so to give her time to think, there's none of that. And there's a little emotional eye accessing. Mark, what do you got after I start? Yeah, yeah thanks. So, so go back and watch when Greg mimes that racking there and goes, hey, how does this work? And my eyes go, oh, no, the gun's just gone off because... <laughs> Because you're absolutely right. Uh, well, number one, you know, when 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 a gun comes out, I know where my eyes are. They're just looking at the gun. They're just going, where's that? Who's got that? Where's that going? Who's handling that? I want to know where that is. So so that that you've got somebody who's the owner of that gun and they're not watching that. Something's up there. Alcohol's involved. I mean, you know, don't even play with fireworks and alcohol. And now we've got a firearm out there. It's not a good combination. Uh, but all the same, we, we're getting these double shoulder shrugs from her. I, I, I agree, Chase, that it's, it's quite a baseline. But I'm still going to count it in there because it's quite pronounced, I think, in this sense of what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? This is just the way it turned out. There isn't any other story I have for you, though. Though I totally agree, uh, Scott. There are there are some, and, and and I think we'll come to that. There are some things not being said about how this occurred or the relationship that at that moment might have might have felt like it was going on. My camera's wobbling because it's 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 balancing on an ice bucket. As we speak right now, <laughs> not not to keep the camera cool, but Mine's just, on a safe, just so, to yeah. elevate it. Yeah, I couldn't find the ironing board. Uh, no, actually, I could. That's a lie. I won't. I won't. I won't give distrust to the Fairmont Hotel. They have lovely ironing boards here. Okay, so lots of double shoulder shrugs, lots of downward intonation as well. That's a good thing. Really assertive about the story. We've got some illustrators coming in. We can just about see them, but that's a good thing. Henry, the name of the person who unfortunately died in this situation, the word gun, weapon, and went off rather than shot or, or, or something a little more nebulous. Like, how did that happen? For me, it's a really clear story, or, or clearish, because I agree, Scott, there's, there's some stuff there, not, not quite there. But it's clear enough for me that it's an accident. And I think that's why she's probably uh, going to be tried for manslaughter, probably rather than murder in this case. I would be surprised based on that story. And if that's the consistent story that she's being given, I would be surprised if it's a murder charge. It's more likely some kind of manslaughter manslaughter cha charge or, you know, whatever they have in, in, in Belize. Uh, Chase, Chase, what do you got? <laughs> Oops, sorry. Hello? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's my, uh, somebody's gotten loose. Um, Chase, what do you got? I think uh, you guys covered a lot of stuff here, and I agree. Let's cover one thing that uh, we didn't cover yet. She's using a lot of illustrative body narration here. You can see her holding the pistol in her right hand and showing the uh, motion of the magazine going into the grip of the gun. You can even see her thumb come around the grip to hit the magazine release where that magazine releases. And she has muscle memory 
maybe not an expert, but she remembers at least holding this gun. Uh, muscle memory that has her opposite hand coming up. The moment her thumb comes down, her opposite hand comes up where that magazine's going to drop out of that gun. Anybody who's fired a gun a few times knows that you can just place your hand down here and you can catch that magazine as it falls out of the gun. That's interesting, but it's precision timing with her thumb coming down and her hand getting into that area. And she says, I wasn't familiar with the mechanisms of the gun. As she's saying this, she illustrates hitting the exact location of that mag release, especially on a Glock pistol. you got to kind of, especially with her size hands, you got to reach forward a little bit. And I think uh, if you're not familiar with a Glock, there's no way physically, in my opinion, if you're a woman or you have hands this size and you are even hitting or touching the magazine release, it's very difficult to reach the magazine release and the trigger at the same time. Maybe somebody will make an independent video of this, but she's shown us she's pretty familiar with the anatomy of the gun a little bit here and shows us this with a little bit of precision. And she says the gun went off. It's the first time we see a deviation in her behavior like this. She leaves her mouth open. Uh, she shows confusion about the gun, contempt at the cocaine uh, accusations, happiness with her discussing her children, struggle shows on her face when she's discussing her husband and her issues, but not any emotion at this gun going off, which I thought was unusual, does not make her deceptive yet. We're looking for clusters. We're not seeing here, but we're not seeing emotion at the gun going off. So Jasmine, you were playing around with the magazine and the bullets, but you yourself were not handling the gun. Is that right? I was practicing unloading and reloading just the magazine. Um, the only time I handled the weapon was at the very end when Henry asked me to pass it to him. So he wanted me to pass him the clip. And at that point, the clip was already back into the weapon. So I was struggling to remove the clip from the gun. Again, I wasn't handling the gun earlier, so I'm not familiar with the mechanisms, how to remove it. I didn't know if I was pressing the right button or not, um, because earlier he had handed me the clip, so I hadn't had to take it out before. Um, so I was struggling with it, and that's when the gun went off. And I'm sure you will hear this when you get to the call. Uh, I'm sure they'll try and paint this picture and say that you were whatever, you'd been drinking, he perhaps made some unfortunate move on you. You'd had the incident the week before, which you'd even reported to him, of fearing something might happen. You yourself say it's a bit weird that he's asked for this back rub, and the next thing he's dead. So you can see that if, you're, if you want to see you as somebody malevolent in this story, then there's quite a lot of evidence there to point to a scenario where you might feel that you wanted to defend yourself. There has been many, many different stories that I've heard. I've heard that I've, I executed him. I've heard that it was an attempted rape and I was defending myself. I've heard that I lured him there and it was Andrew that shot him. I've heard so many different stories. The truth of the matter is, it's none of that. He's my friend, he was my friend. He did not make a pass at me. I considered Henry like a protector. So as much as the rumor mill will go crazy over this situation, it really isn't what they're saying. It was a friend. We weren't meant to be alone. Andrew was supposed to be there. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so around the back rub area, there we get a single shoulder shrug, I believe, and a look for approval and then back to a composed smile. That's where I think we do have something around a relationship here that she doesn't want to discuss. Something going on there that will put her in a bad light. It could be actually, in the grand scheme of things, really quite minor. But within this context, this, this minor element that may or may not have gone, up, gone on here could just exacerbate the situation for her and put her in a bad light and cause her a, a lot of problem and injury. So I, I think that's an area where we're getting some form of story not quite being told there. 
I mean, she doesn't say anything about it. I, I, I just think she's withholding information around what really happened there. Look, there's a, there's a story here, I think, that then comes out later or a narrative here that says he was considered protection. He was a protector. And but Andrew was supposed to be there. And if Andrew had been there, the protector, somebody who was protective, wouldn't have died. Well, that's quite an interesting kind of big story of being let down by your the person who's meant to be your closest ally, your 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 partner, common law partner, your 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 wife, your husband, whoever it might be. They're meant to be the person who looks after you most. And if they'd have been there, like they said they were going to be there nobody would have died. And I think it's interesting that she puts forward this big narrative here and puts some some covert blame on her, uh, I guess, ex-husband. I don't, um, they've been through a divorce yet. I don't think they have. So These are common still, law. And I yeah, think- so still, well, still common law uh, uh, husband then. Yeah, I agree with you. Pierce actually set this up in a masterful way here. The way he asked this question, he's giving her an opportunity to not only change her story a bit, but to edit her experience to increase her level of innocence. She doesn't really take it, which I found really interesting. Pierce words this in a way to make her almost a victim. Uh, And you see this contempt with this shoulder shrug that Greg's describing to you. We can't see her elbow here. But I think this might be a situation where we're seeing like a pugilistic joust gesture. This is almost always a concealed disagreement or anger. You can see my elbow go up as my shoulder comes up. And as a perfect example of this is during one of Obama's speeches, someone shouts out, you lie really loud while he's giving a speech. And you can see this perfect elbow jump. Maybe we can put in a a clip of that here. The reforms I'm proposing would not apply to those who are here illegal. And when she said next thing he's dead, then she resets her body and her face for the punchline of the question or Pierce says that. Sorry. And I think this is an unusual thing we're seeing here. She's showing almost no discomfort with reciting any of these stories that she's heard and no hesitation saying all the horrific things that could have been done. And she's also demonstrated comfort using his name shows a genuine smile when talking about him more than anything else that we've seen here. She's also showing zero shame, guilt, remorse, sadness, uh, disgust, regret, maybe anger, what we might expect to see. But there's also no other emotion around almost anything else either. It's kind of a minimal amount of behaviors. This doesn't make her guilty, but it leads me to ask different questions. I wish I could ask some targeted questions. She's locked down on how Andrew was supposed to be there. Andrew wasn't there. So different things happen. No matter what, if three people make plans and one doesn't show up, the course of events changes. The other two don't pretend the other person is there. They behave as though the other person didn't make it. Uh, This goes for anybody. Even if kids are planning a sleepover and one doesn't show up, the two kids will have a completely different night together. Right. So any three people there. Uh, And in the next video, we're going to see something pretty interesting uh, with some body narration. Yeah, I'm not gonna have a lot on this one. You guys have covered almost everything. But here here is there's amusement in her face and she is telling and not asking, meaning she knows where she's at in this situation and she's walking through the mechanics of it. Not a lot of emotion, but there's more of that accessing to the left of how do I characterize this? And I think in part, the reason that's occurring is because she's trying to ensure that she doesn't misrepresent something or represent something in a way that makes her look guilty. Even if nothing happened, you can easily make a mistake by saying the wrong set of words that tie people back and say all that other unrelated stuff matters and makes you guilty. There's currently a case that's just been rejected in the state of Georgia by the Supreme Court of Georgia and pushed back for a life sentence for a guy who was a, who was convicted of leaving his child in the car intentionally because they brought up unrelated charges or unrelated issues around him sexting underage people in that. And so that was rejected by the Supreme Court. It's really easy for people to make decisions based on other input as if it were pertinent to the case. And I'm sure you will hear this when you get to the court. Uh, I'm sure they'll try and paint this picture and say that you were 
whatever you've been drinking, he perhaps made some unfortunate move on you, you'd had the incident the week before, which you'd even reported to him, of fearing something might happen. You yourself say it's a bit weird that he's asked for this back rub, and the next thing he's dead. So you can see that if, you're, if you want to see you as somebody malevolent in this story, then there's quite a lot of evidence there to point to a scenario where you might feel that you wanted to defend yourself. There's been many, many different stories that I've heard. I've heard that I've, I executed him. I've heard that it was an attempted rape and I was defending myself. I've heard that I lured him there and it was Andrew that shot him. I've heard so many different stories. The truth of the matter is, it's none of that. He's my friend, he was my friend. He did not make a pass at me. I considered Henry like a protector. So as much as the rumor mill will go crazy over this situation, it really isn't what they're saying. It was a friend. We weren't meant to be alone. Andrew was supposed to be there. Physically was Henry at the moment he was shot dead. I mean, how far away from you was he? He was sitting to my left, um, slightly on an angle. I had my left leg bent behind him and my right leg was straight. So I'd say, I guess a foot or two away. Your left leg was behind him. Mm -hmm. When you realized the, the gun had gone off, what were your feelings? It was a loud bang. Then my ears were ringing. I just, I was in shock. Um, Henry fell back on top of me. Um, at that point, I realized one of us was hurt. I could see blood and feel the blood. Um, so then I tried to wiggle out from under him. And that's when he started slipping into the water and I tried to catch him. Of course, he was a lot bigger than me, so I couldn't hold him up. So, you know, it's, it's still very difficult to talk about it. I don't, I don't like to talk about it. it um, it was a horrible night that changed everyone's lives and ended some. So I have to live with that for the rest of my life. So, uh, Chase, what do you got? Body narration and eye movement are on cue here and in match with each other. When she's saying my left leg was bent behind him, she even leans over to imagine how she was positioned. She said my right leg was straight, uses a lot more congruent body narration. And when she's saying about a foot and a half to two feet, this is uh, a detail she's cemented in her mind, having to relive and retell and reprocess this event, knowing this is a known fact in her head or a known belief in her head. The fact she would feign confusion, which it might be here, is a little bit alarming to me. And there's this question, your left leg was behind him. There's some uncertainty. There's a desire to move on with the story. Uh, the tone was a little bit uneven and unplanned. And you hear this little, little, mm -hmm, this little uh, grunt of affirmation. I think the uncertainty here increases her cognitive load, which is what she's processing in her head and makes the production of coherent speech and sounds a little bit more complex, a little bit more difficult she just wanted to move past this and i think that's what we're seeing here and when he asked what were your feelings it was a loud bang when you realized the, the gun had gone off what were your feelings it was a loud bang that was interesting to me uh and it was a horrible night that changed everyone's lives there's a double mismatched shrug again stay an emotional accessing though when her eyes are moving down into her right when she's talking about these emotions and it ended some she said it, it disturbed everybody's life it ended some there's distancing from henry here and not only is there almost no emotion here there's no discussion of emotion even if you want to keep the emotion hidden i would expect personally to maybe see some discussion of emotion. I cried, I screamed, I felt nauseous, some kind of explanation. Imagine describing hurting someone that you love on accident. Every emotion you could think of would be soaking through every aspect of that story. But not everybody's the same. 
A lot of behavior here is consistent with somebody telling mostly truth so far, but there are some serious uh, maybe orange flags, maybe dark orange. I'd want to ask some further questions about Pierce tried to do this. He asked her how she felt and she tried her best to answer. And I think she seriously missed the mark of describing uh, some real emotion. And we're going to hear about that later. If you listen to the whole interview, she describes how she couches all of her emotions and lets them out in private. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think that stress mouth at the beginning lets us know there's something coming up about what happened. And we really better pay close, pay close attention to this as it goes forward to whatever's coming next. And then she says she's sitting behind him with one leg, with her left leg um, scooched up and her, other, her right leg sticking out. And she's one to two feet behind him as she's describing where she is. That's that doesn't. And she's to his, his what she say is left. Um, it just doesn't it doesn't sound right. If like like I was saying earlier, if if my wife came out to a dock and I was sitting on the dock and there was a girl sitting like that up next to me with their leg like that and one sticking out that way and rubbing on my back, there'd be a homicide and it would be my wife committing it. It would be me. And she wouldn't give a hoot about the girl, she, the, the woman. She would, you, you get out of here. But it would be I'd be the one to get it. This isn't this isn't right. What's happening here? I mean, for somebody she's she's dang near estranged from her husband. Right. This guy is, I believe he may be divorced at this point because he said he was, uh, from what I understand, he said he was going on a date that night with her. So I think he had, I think he had plans. And I think she, again, I want to say, I think she, she needed something, something from him. He needed to do something for her. She wanted him to do something for her. And that's why they were out there. He thought something else was going to happen. Again, we're seeing no emotions that we should be seeing. No anger, no grief. No, nothing. It's just it's just a smooth, loping story that's going along. So at, for me, that it's odd seeing that you're not seeing the emotions we should be should be seeing when you're talking about someone that, you know, shooting them by accident and killing them and him falling off into the water. We're not we're not seeing any of that stuff. And I think we should be. So that that's a lot of red flags for me at that point. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So. I think we do see emotions. I think when he, ironically, when he goes into the water, she starts to very subtly and slowly drift into emotions. There is, if you, but because it's so slow and because they're so subtle, I think it's it's like a bit of a very thin flowing tap. You can't see the bucket filling up. But here's what I would say. If you go before that moment and then you cut to way after that moment, you'll see a significant change. It's just, it's so slow for her. And I, I, I would agree, Chase. I, it's interesting. I don't know particularly the language you're talking about in subsequent um, uh, videos that we'll be looking at. But my prediction on this is this is somebody who finds it very hard to show emotions. Because the end, the language is of bottling it up. It's really hard. She wants she wants this to stop right now. I think she's probably not used to handling those emotions, especially not in front of people on national television. That isn't necessarily the place where. And she may have a history of being able to control them, or a history of being around a history of being around people who don't show their emotions very much um because you know english can be a bit yeah i was about to say you think english can be a little bit like that and you know what if you don't fit in like the, you you're not accepted there's no like well you be american you do what you like if you're part of a british very british family one with a lot of power then you have to fit in with them not the other way around and so i think it might be something personal or cultural or personal and cultural here um that she isn't used to showing these emotions but i would say just notice that moment when the body is described as hitting the water that the water kind of flow of, of emotion flows through her is quite is quite subtle i would agree that uh-huh moment there mm -hmm. is it's a non-answer and it's like brush over that i'm not even going to talk about that because something was going on there i believe it could have been quite subtle and and, and relatively non-important but when you're probably going to get yourself into a custody case like any little thing any little thing's going to look bad especially in a custody case with people who are very 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 powerful uh, on 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 a very big small island, let alone 
a very small, small kind of little village island, you know? Uh, so that's what I got on that one. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I think this is the crux of this entire series of videos we're watching right here. What happens right here is what we should pay close attention to, because there is out of baseline behavior. That out of baseline behavior is a couple of things. First of all, it is that. Uh huh. That is the one thing that's uncomfortable. But why he, he said or she says, I was my left leg was behind him and my right leg out straight, I think is the key. And when she says that, he says, what was the distance? She says a foot or two. That's fishing to see if you're getting approval, a foot or two. And that's probably good enough. That's good enough for her to get away. And then he asks again, your left leg was behind him. You get that uncomfortable, mm -hmm, followed by a really weird little head nod, very nervous. And he misses the key opportunity to say, why were you that close to him? Because that's the crux of this matter. Why were you that close? Furthermore, why was a guy comfortable, a, a police officer comfortable with you playing with his his service weapon behind him, one to two feet behind him. That means somebody is comfortable in that kind of space with you, whether you perceive that there's something going on or they perceive there's something going on, something's going on because they would be uncomfortable with you sitting that close to behind them with a firearm in your hand at the time. And you're not massaging unless it's some new massage I have, haven't seen, but if somebody's got a firearm on one hand and massaging me with the other, we're going to find a different, a different setup from that for me. It's just not the way things work. But she starts off with lip compression in containing something. Is that emotion? Is it information she's withholding? I don't know. She does that left eye movement again, and that's congruent with her trying to figure out how to, how to characterize something. I think if you're her and you're in the situation where a guy's just died and you say, hey, we were kind of screwing around and I shot him. How does that go? Or he wanted something to go further and I shot him. How does that go? If you're saying something, the least amount, Mark, to your point, the least amount of anything that can sound incriminating, whether it was incriminating or not, is important. If we go back and we look at, you know, that case I was just talking about recently, anything that somebody can drag into court to taint the minds of folks are going after is going to have powerful is going to have power. Um, anyway, after she talks about the actual shot, there's a distaste kind of thing in her mouth. You know, she does that uh, as she talks about him sliding into the water, him wiggling or trying to wiggle out from under him. There's also a withdrawal of her chin. We typically associate with kind of a gag reflex when she talks about him being hurt. And then finally a wrinkling of her nose in disgust as she talks about blood and some asymmetry in her jaw. Is she emotional in the way I classically would think people are? No, Mark, I was thinking the same thing. If you're living in a powerful, powerful English family, I'm, I'm sure they don't like a whole lot of emotional displays in public. Matter of fact, the next thing you know, you might be on Oprah saying, they told me I'm not allowed to cry in public. So you know how that goes. Americans are good at that and might bring some of the royal family with you. You just never know. That's all I got. Physically was Henry at the moment he was shot dead. I mean, how far away from you was he? He was sitting to my left, um, slightly on an angle. I had my left leg bent behind him and my right leg was straight. So I'd say, I guess a foot or two away. Your left leg was behind him? Mm hmm When you realized the, the gun had gone off, what were your feelings? It was a loud bang, then my ears were ringing. I just, I was in shock. Um, Henry fell back on top of me. Um, at that point, I realized one of us was hurt. I could see blood and feel the blood. Um, so then I tried to wiggle out from under him. And that's when he started slipping into the water and I tried to catch him. Of course, he was a lot bigger than me, so I couldn't hold him up. So, you know, it's, it's still very difficult to talk about it. I don't, I don't like to talk about it. It, um, it was a horrible night that changed everyone's lives and ended some. So I have to live with that for the rest of my life. So you are familiar with guns, aren't you? You know how to use them and fire them. I'm not familiar with nine millimeters, no. Right, but I mean, I've seen videos, uh, which I know you will have seen too, um, of you expertly shooting a watermelon, for example on the beach, firing at a, at, a, at a range. And you're certainly, it seems to me, a proficient shooter. You know what you're doing with a gun. I greatly disagree with you. Uh, I've never owned a gun in my life. I've never owned a firearm. 
I grew up on a farm where, you know, I had six brothers and a father and they had shotguns. So I've seen shotguns, I've never owned one, I've fired them, you know, a few times, but I'm not an expert. And what that video doesn't show you is the 10 times I tried to hit that watermelon and missed. And that video was shot by my ex. Right, I suppose the point I would make is that if, I, I don't know if that's true or not, I've got no reason to doubt you. I'm just saying that in the video clip, you look very proficient with a gun. I mean, you look like you know what you're doing with the gun that you're using to fire the watermelon as you do at the range. And I suppose the reason I'm asking that is that when this gun goes off, you claim you don't even remember firing the trigger, but even the most basic uh, person using a gun with the most basic knowledge knows that to fire a gun, you have to fire the trigger. Right, and I don't remember ever touching that trigger on the gun, so I don't know what happened. To be honest, I just was trying to get the clip out and it just went off. I don't remember ever touching the trigger, so I'm not sure if it was a faulty weapon or not. I, I really can't tell you how it went off. Right, but I'm All right, well, I'll go first on this one. I think the person that doesn't know anything about guns here is Piers Morgan. I mean, when he sees that, he shows that video of her shooting the shotgun and says, you seem proficient as a weapon. She's, whoever took her to do that, they, they shouldn't have let her do that. They shouldn't let her do it because the gun, she's holding the shotgun away from her shoulder. When it goes off, it slams into her shoulder. I'll bet she had a bruise that big on her the next day. Whoever's teaching, whoever's supposedly teaching her to shoot or helping her shoot, that's that's not somebody that loves her or they don't know what they're doing either, you know. And who says fire a trigger you, to, to shoot a gun? You need to fire the trigger. Have you all ever heard that before? You three? One one time I was with Prince Andrew on an ordinary shooting weekend. <laughs> yes. And, and he was me. firing the trigger? <laughs> Well, a proficient shooter wouldn't wouldn't let that happen to her. So, pl plus the fact she says she talks about how the video was shot by her ex. What, what does that have to do with anything at this point? So, Chase, what do you got? So I was a uh, in the when I was in the military, I was a black beret, expeditionary warfare guy. Gunfighting was my bread and butter, my life blood. I know a lot of guys who are in this field the most elite gunfighters on the planet who don't own their own guns. Owning a gun is different from being good at guns. And when she's referring to the gun as a nine millimeter, which is for you, if you don't know about guns, it's just the caliber of the bullet. People around shotguns their entire lives will typically use the caliber or gauge of the gun to refer to a particular gun. This is what we might be seeing here. I want the 12 gauge or the 20 gauge. This is common in shotguns, not so common with other guns. She seems to have a firm grasp on trigger discipline. The shotgun video shows her finger coming out of the trigger housing immediately after the shot. The rifle photo shows her finger straight and outside the trigger housing. And Pierce says, oh, well, I don't know if that's true or not. And there's a challenging smile and it's a little odd here. I hope it's a result of editing and not maybe how she responded to being questioned. Uh, but I don't think that's true. And fired shotguns a few times. There's a dramatic increase in blink rate. I think it's more than a few times. I spent part of my career as a, you know, a gunfighter and the training we went through had us using about a thousand rounds a day for a long period of time. And I can also say that I've shot combat weapons a few times. This is a few times for me might be a thousand rounds or 15 or 20 or 30,000 rounds. So a few is a word that requires definition for that person. And that as an interrogator, I'm sure all of us would have jumped all over. Well, wait, hold on. What do you mean by a few? She says, I don't remember touching the trigger on the gun. There's two single shrugs here. I think may, this does not mean deception. I think she doubts the confidence. Like, I don't know if I actually touched that trigger. That could be what we're seeing here because there's not a lot of other deceptive stuff around touching the trigger that's coming up. But things aren't lining up like they should be. She's showing honesty about a lot of elements in this story. And we're seeing stress and potential deception about other things, which I think will be crystal clear in the next video. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, one, one thing. 
shooting a shotgun, if you are proficient with a shotgun, you sure as hell don't hold it the way she's holding it to Scott's point. Cause a 12 gauge kicks pretty good. I don't know what kind of shot they were using. Probably something pretty light loads that looked like a place you go to shoot. And the guys, my, my expectation would be two things, Chase. Number one, if you put your finger on the trigger, when you're moving, you're, you're off the range. You got range officers there who keep you moving. Number one, number two, they probably taught her to do it. And if she grew up around brothers and a father that say, get your finger off the trigger. That would be one thing she would remember regardless. So I agree with you. That's a good indicator. She's been taught something. And, and the number of rounds, the only reason I don't think she's done a lot is because she would know to pocket that shotgun because they kick. And if it's got bird shot in it or something, so what? And you know, that isn't overall proficient. If you can't hit a watermelon with a shotgun 15 feet away. Yeah. That's, that's pretty easy with about a 30 inch barrel. So pretty easy. I could, you, I could teach to do that in a, in, in 30 minutes. So it's just not that hard to do. Uh, one thing that's interesting, she starts off. I'm not an expert by any stretch. She's declaring, and she is confrontational chase the entire time, which is, I think in keeping with the message she's trying to go, she has that intake face in the beginning and she's got nervous, ex- that nervous acceptance from before though is now gone. She's just sitting there. And then she goes into telling her head starts to kind of move around a little bit more rigidly than it normally would. And like I usually say, if you can't recognize that in women, you've probably not been in an altercation with a woman or you're too stupid to realize you have. That's, you know, movement of head a lot of times accompanies that. And then those lower teeth expose. She's smiling and she does one brow up in skepticism or criticism. And then you can see amusement. See, those eyes are a light, but her lower face isn't. She's done with this conversation. She thinks she's winning here. And the only problem you got to be careful with is if this is in front of a jury and they're showing that same video and these people never own firearms and especially Mark, if there is have, if there haves and have nots and have shoot shotguns and have nots don't that can affect the outcome. So I know she has to be keenly aware of this. Well, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. And I think that's why she's being a little more combative. I think, uh, you know, I think from my point of view, there's a very clear denial around the nine millimeter uh, proficiency. Now, just like you say, Chase, that might be true or false, but I think she's purposely denying that in a clear way because she she needs to be seen as somebody who doesn't really know how to handle uh, a gun. Uh, f- she puts forward very clearly faulty weapon. I don't know whether it's a faulty weapon or not. So now she's putting down the idea where it may have just been, you know, a fault in the weapon, no fault of mine. And I think that's why, as you say, Chase, we get this collision of single shrugs and double shrugs around. Uh, um, I can't can't tell you how it went off again putting this idea there of we just don't know why this thing happened and i have no proficiency in this because i think it's important because she knows and it's true because we just saw it that piers is a master manipulator of the media he just showed an image there of he talked about a shotgun and and uh you know a melon being exploded and then he shows a still of her with you know what looks like some kind of automatic uh you know assault type weapon with her smiling with a target in the background which has a balaclava on okay and he doesn't mention it he doesn't go so tell me about this image because she could say hey you know that's that's part of the the entertainment they have at the range or, Hey, I was in Las Vegas. Like a lot of people do that when they go there, there may be an entirely reasonable. And they said, Hey, hold the gun and smile. So I smiled. Okay. There could be all kinds of reasonable ideas as to why you would have that image, but he doesn't want to talk about that. He just wants to show you that image. Why does he want to do that? Why would he just want to do that out the, Blue. He's a smart guy. He wouldn't do. Nobody does that by accident. That's on purpose. That's organized. Well, I want to know why it's organized, <laughs> because that's a really interesting thing to organize and not talk about. You are familiar with guns, aren't you? You know how to use them and fire them. I'm not familiar with nine millimeters. No. Right. But I mean, I've seen videos, uh, which I know you will have seen, too, um, of you expertly shooting a watermelon, for example on the beach, firing at a, at, a, at a range. And you're certainly, it seems to me, a proficient shooter. You know what you're doing with a gun. I greatly disagree with you. Uh, I've never owned a gun in my life. I've never owned a firearm. I grew up on a farm where, you know, I had six brothers and a father and they had shotguns. So 
I've seen shotguns. I've never owned one. I've fired them, you know, a few times, but I'm not an expert. And what that video doesn't show you is the 10 times I tried to hit that watermelon and missed. And that video was shot by my ex. Right, I suppose the point I would make is that if, I, I don't know if that's true or not, I've got no reason to doubt you. I'm just saying that in the video clip, you look very proficient with a gun. I mean, you look like you know what you're doing with the gun that you're using to fire the watermelon as you do at the range. And I suppose the reason I'm asking that is that when this gun goes off, you claim you don't even remember firing the trigger, but even the most basic uh, person using a gun with the most basic knowledge knows that to fire a gun, you have to fire the trigger. Right, and I don't remember ever touching that trigger on the gun, so I don't know what happened. To be honest, I just was trying to get the clip out and it just went off. I don't remember ever touching the trigger, so I'm not sure if it was a faulty weapon or not. I, I really can't tell you how it went off. His sister has said that I lured Henry there for someone else to kill him. His other sister thinks that I execution style murdered him. His mother thinks something else. They, I, I mean, everyone's, everyone's thinking their own story. You're saying that this is all a complete accident. Others, including his family, are saying it was murder, that you meant to kill him for whatever reason. What is curious to me is that your first story when you were asked about it was that he'd been shot by somebody from a boat that was nearby. Why did you say that? I don't remember saying that. I shouldn't have said it if I said it, but I really don't remember saying that at all. I really don't. And I've, tr I've been told I've said it and I, I don't remember saying it. So I'm trying to rationalize if I did, I must have been in shock. I must have been scared. I'm not sure, but I don't remember saying it. But you accept that, that if you did say that, that was a complete lie because you knew you'd shot him. Correct. I mean, from the moment I was at the police station and I gave my caution statement, my story has been exactly what happened. It was an accident. From the very beginning at the police station, I told them it was an accident. I told them I was trying to get the magazine out. The gun went off. I thought the gun was empty. Um, so that's never been different. What this story is about the passing of the boat, that's in my opinion, a complete made-up rumor. Um, and like I said, I don't remember saying that, um, and I'm trying to ra rationalize why that would even be going around. Greg, what do you got? I'm going to be short on this one. Look, if, if you're going to lie, you probably wouldn't say, if I said that, it was a lie. That is, there's a lot of stuff in here that makes me want to go, hmm, why would she say that, number one? But she starts off when he's saying our at you are saying respiration increases or blink rate increases. She flips her hair off of her, off of her body. She doesn't do it in any other video we've seen. So you immediately go, why, why, why is it? Because it's irritating her. Is it something she saw? Is there something going on? So a handful of things that make me really want to go, hold on a minute. And then she was shaking her head in distaste or disdain or something. It was murder. Then she goes to that. I don't remember. And her baseline is all still there. Still fairly fluid communication, all of her hands are moving, her eyes are moving to access the same things. So while I immediately want to jump up and go, hold on a minute, why would you tell them that? I also realized that maybe she didn't tell them that. Maybe somebody said she told them that. Maybe it's misunderstood. Maybe she said a boat was going by and a shot and, and I don't know. So what we aren't, as Chase always likes to say, is we are not the forensics panel. We don't know what was said at the site. We don't know what was. She doesn't recall saying it can also be a way to get away from it. Jury's out on this one for me because I can't say with definitive, uh, any kind of def definition that she did or did not tell them or that she looks like she didn't. Usually I would say this. If a person's willing to say, if I said that it was a lie, they probably are not lying to you because they got no way to win in that case. And now I'll say, is that true? Or is this true? And they'll say, this is the truth. If I said that before I was lying, you don't hear that very often in the interrogation room. So my gut starts to go, well, and I don't usually do gut, but my gut says she's probably telling the truth that she doesn't recall saying that, or maybe it was a combination of words that made it sound like that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, we've got all these double shrugs again, which is either her baseline or her, her usual kind of atmosphere of, hey, this is just the way it is. We've got a, a lot of illustrators as well. So that that's 
feels pretty honest. We've got some chin raised there. I think she's getting angry because I think she's indignant around this. I think this is about the rumour mill on this little island and this idea that, hang on, this is just made up. Maybe I said it, maybe I didn't. I don't remember it. If I did, I was making stuff up but maybe it's made up as well. It's a little island with a rumor mill and there's some people who have more power than others there. Okay, so yeah, I, it, it, I agree with you, Greg. It feels pretty honest to me what's going on there. Uh, Chase, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you all. One thing I notice here, there's comfortable, she is comfortable describing the severity of the opinions of the other people around the incident doesn't couch words, doesn't mince words or, make, or replace them with nicer ones. She's comfortable with ambiguity. She's comfortable not knowing. And she says, if I did, it must have been in shock. She's processing information. You can see a, an eye flutter there. This looks honest to me. She's comfortable with uncertainty and she's not willing to inject ambiguity. She's not trying to, to push ambiguity into the story. And it's aligned with a single principle and a single story. Scott? Yeah, this is the first one I saw when I said, I believe her. I, I, at this point, when I, I said, I thought for sure she was telling the truth. Everything to me looks like she's just loping along, telling, I agree with you, Mark, that indignant look goes along with that. Everybody, y'all are, everybody's nailing it. I, this is, but this is where I said, yeah, I believe her because I'm not seeing anything in there that shows deception of what she's talking about. And, and some people say when she says, I don't know, and the don't went up really high, I think that's from stress from having said that she, she uh, there's stress in there because she said, I don't know how that happened. Be, and she said that before. So I don't, I don't think she's, she's lying here. I think she's being honest. And I think we're seeing the truth out of her at this point. That's what I get. His sister has said that I lured Henry there for someone else to kill him. His other sister thinks that I execution style murdered him his mother thinks something else they I, I mean everyone's everyone's thinking their own story you're saying that this is all a complete accident others including his family are saying it was murder that you meant to kill him for whatever reason what is curious to me is that your first story when you were asked about it was that he'd been shot by somebody from a boat that was nearby why did you say that? I don't remember saying that. I shouldn't have said it if I said it, but I really don't remember saying that at all. I really don't. And I've, tr I've been told I've said it, and I, I don't remember saying it. So I'm trying to rationalize if I did. I must have been in shock. I must have been scared. I'm not sure. But I don't remember saying it. But you accept that, that if you did say that, that was a complete lie because you knew you'd shot him. Correct. I mean, from the moment I was at the police station and I gave my caution statement, my story has been exactly what happened. It was an accident. From the very beginning at the police station, I told them it was an accident. I told them I was trying to get the magazine out. The gun went off. I thought the gun was empty. Um, so that's never been different. What this story is about the passing of the boat, that's in my opinion, a complete made up rumor. Um, and like I said, I don't remember saying that. Um, and I'm trying to ra rationalize why that would even be going around. Several weeks ago, you were rearrested uh, because there were claims that you had ordered a hit, uh, a murder hit on the chief of police, uh, Belize police, Commissioner Chester Williams, and the magistrate involved in your custody battle. You were then later released, but uh, was there any merit to the suggestion that you were making such threats or organizing some kind of hit? I'm actually very glad you brought this up because that was very recently, that was, sorry, very recent um, that I was re-arrested. I have been detained and arrested for ridiculous bogus charges and false allegations. Is it true as Police Commissioner Chester Williams has now stated publicly that you sent him a series of disturbing messages which he said were threatening. That's not true at all. So I have sent Chester messages um, and I'm more than happy to share each and every one of the messages where I'm asking him to please stop his attacks on me 
Out of interest, why, why are you text messaging the police commissioner at all? That's completely inappropriate, isn't it, for somebody under charges like you? No, I don't feel it's inappropriate. I met Chester because he was a friend of mine and a friend of Andrew's. So Chester gave me his phone number. It might not be standard to write the commissioner, but keep in mind he was also my friend and he has been writing me back over the last year. Um, and yeah, the shock that I experienced reading the disclosure, knowing what they were doing, I don't think it's very wrong for me to ask um, the commissioner of police to do a, a lawful investigation, to follow his oath and to be ethical. I, I don't believe that's wrong for me to ask that of him. All right, Chase, what do you got? This is honest behavior. I'm gonna go ahead and say it. There's eye rolling right at this mention of murder hit, which kind of reminds me of murder death kill. Uh, <laughs> from I think Demolition Man was that movie. Uh, there's, there's comfort with the story. And then there's no discomfort with defense. There's no discomfort with defense. And there's an immediate admission of behavior here. Yes, I did that. Yes, I did that. I'm happy to provide more information. No injection of ambiguity. We're seeing less concealment in her behavior here than in the other clips. And I think there's genuine anger at discussing the legitimacy of her actions. I think we see a little micro expression of anger when she's talking about, yes, it is okay that I did that. He was my friend. There's perfect timing with the gestures and the language throughout. You hear Scott mostly talk about this between all four of us of how gestures don't time and don't hit right at the right moments. These are all on point uh, from what I saw. And again, we do not compare notes before we record these. So these guys might destroy me after this. Who knows? Mark, what do you got? <laughs> it's not going to happen because not only do we get an eye roll, I think we get a very specific eye roll where the eyes go low, first of all. And, it, and it's that one of indignation of how low will they go? How low will they go to get, give this idea of uh, a hit? allegation on, I guess it was a police chief or something, something like that. I think total indig indignation and some anger uh, on that and, and a sense, probably a sense of betrayal as well um, on the, from this little village island connected to a very powerful uh, UK Lord. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah. Congruency is the, is the, the whole message. I, same thing you both said, her words, her actions, all of it are moving smoothly. I listened for that long vowel to look and see if she needed time to think. There's none of that going on. She admitted, yes, I did send text, and you can see them all. Anytime you see people doing that and they're willing to open the books, that's usually a great sign. When she eye accesses for memory, it's above the brow ridge and back into right where she goes for memory again. Her speech patterns haven't shifted. Her face and head are illustrating the same message her hands and her mouth are doing. And she drops to emotional accessing down into a right at the appropriate times. This congruent messaging, I think you're dead on. This is truth. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you guys. I, I, I believe I believe this one. And I believe that when when then Piers is talking about the guy she's supposed to to be in, been uh, trying to get somebody to kill him. I think the guy was mad at her because he killed his friend. So I think that this is is truthful. I'm not seeing any bit of deception here whatsoever. She just lopes along and and everything looks as it should to me. We good? Yep. Yeah. Several weeks ago, you were rearrested uh, because there were claims that you had ordered a hit, uh, a murder hit on the chief of police, uh, Belize police, Commissioner Chester Williams and the magistrate involved in your custody battle. You were then later released, but uh, was there any merit to the suggestion that you were making such threats or organizing some kind of hit? I'm actually very glad you brought this up because that was very recently, that was, sorry, very recent um, that I was re-arrested. I have been detained and arrested for ridiculous bogus charges and false allegations. Is it true as Police Commissioner Chester Williams has now stated publicly that you sent him a series of disturbing messages which he said were threatening. And that's not true at all. So I have sent Chester messages um, and I'm more than happy to share each and every one of the messages where I'm asking him to please stop his attacks on me. Out of interest, why, why are you text messaging the police commissioner at all? That's completely inappropriate, isn't it, for somebody under charges like you 
No, I, I don't feel it's inappropriate. I met Chester because he was a friend of mine and a friend of Andrew's. So Chester gave me his phone number. It might not be standard to write the commissioner, but keep in mind he was also my friend and he has been writing me back over the last year. Um, and yeah, the shock that I experienced reading the disclosure, knowing what they were doing, I don't think it's very wrong for me to ask um, the commissioner of police to do a, a lawful investigation, to follow his oath and to be ethical. I, I don't believe that's wrong for me to ask that of him. A piece in a newspaper about the case last week that ended by concluding that you're due for trial later this year, that will be, the piece said, when we learn just who the real Jasmine Harton is. Murderous Jezebel, or a woman deeply wronged and set up for a fall by a vengeful dynasty. Yes, I saw that article. Um, I'm definitely not a murderer, and I am being set up. I am, I, I really am. This is terrifying. I've only ever seen things like this happen in movies. Um, I'm literally trapped in a big unfair game, which is ironic because that's Michael's book, where captive lions are tranquilized and then hunted. And I strongly can relate to that right now. It's such a small country. Everybody's terrified of them. Uh, they, they own the bank. They own the newspapers. They own the economy of this country. The commissioner is their best friend. The prime minister stays at Alaya Hotel in San Pedro. The problem you have with all this is, I mean, all of that may be true, as far as I know. I have no idea. Um, what, what is indisputable is that you fired the gun which killed this man. That's indisputable, isn't it? I was holding the firearm when it went off, so... Yeah, but, I mean, they don't fire themselves, do they? Like I said, it's dark. I'm trying to release the magazine. And just to let you know, so you mentioned a comment about the, the shotgun. That's a very different mechanism than a 9mm gun, which I'm not familiar with at all. So if my hand touched the trigger, it wasn't intentional and I didn't know it happened. My focus was, I wasn't even looking at Henry, I'm looking at the gun, trying to get the clip out so he could reload it so we could leave. Um, and I, I don't remember touching it, so I don't know how else to answer this same question. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, so Piers Morgan, you, you are a very naughty boy. <laughs> you, you really are. And you know, you know what you're doing there. Uh, so I'll just say this. So it's, there's a certain level of irony or not that this is Piers Morgan uncensored. So the moment you see that on any show, just as if you were seeing O'Reilly's No Spin Zone or you're at the Ministry of Truth, you have to understand the double speak that's going to be going on here, okay? That in the No Spin Zone, it was obviously spin. That's why you call it the No Spin Zone. In the Ministry of Truth, it's they're obviously lying. That's why they call it the Ministry of Truth. In Piers Morgan's Uncensored, you've got to wonder... What is being censored here? Is it truly an uncensorship or is there is there a true and, I, and I'm not saying he's not giving every side of the story, but I think throughout this, he's been delivering some pieces of information which which he knows will have an effect. And then at some point he does say, I just don't know whether it's true that your in-laws have a huge amount of influence, if not very close to almost owning the pay packets of all the officials there. Piers doesn't think that that might be true. Come on. Come on. You're not, you're not talking to an idiot here. Anyway, Chase, what do you got on this one? Mark, uh, what hotel are you staying at? Uh, this is the Fairmont uh, in, um, in uh, where the hell am I? Quebec. Quebec. Quebec, thank you. Thank well, you. Well, whether or not that's actually true, let me tell you what I think uh, about this video. <laughs> <laughs> She's comfortable. <laughs> There's somebody knocking at the door immediately. Chase, <laughs> should I should I answer that? No, Is don't 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 okay. do that. <laughs> All right. So here's what I think. She's comfortable and confident during this denial. The expressions and the gestures are matched. They're in sync. 
She admits to the crime, but distances from it a little bit. And there's a clear perpetrator for her circumstances. And she shifts to present tense to retell. It's dark. I'm trying to release the magazine. It wasn't even, uh, I wasn't even looking at Henry. I am looking at the gun. The body narration is perfectly in sync. You see her hands come up talking about this. And she's saying, I'm trying again, present tense to get the clip out. Everything here syncs up with things that we see when we see truthful people talk. And I would say there is about a 1% chance of deception in, in this clip. Scott. I agree. I didn't see any deception at all. Nothing at all. She's, she's loping along just like she should. The thing about the trigger she doesn't remember her her hand being on the trigger because she's goofing around with it. She's just over there poking around, sticking things in, making it come out, and then she actually shot that guy. So I, I believe her. I got, I got nothing on this because there's there's no deception here, and I agree with you. It's it's all truthful. Everything, all the cues and, and tells we're seeing are truthful. Greg, what do you got? Yes, yeah, same guys. I see she starts off by containing emotion in the beginning. She's doing that brave face for taking input. She knows she's going to be slapped around by Pierce Morgan. She takes it. There's that contained smile again when he says murderous Jezebel. And then look at her dominant eye, how narrow that has become. She's curt. She's direct. And she's I'm definitely not a murderer. All of her illustrators, her language, her head movement, all of that's the same. She illustrates position. She even says I was holding the gun when it fired. Even though he says, you shot him, you shot him. She says, I was holding a gun when it fired. So she admits the guilt of that, not saying, you know, I killed this guy. And then her brow goes up, her face goes, when you see the upper brow, all this go up and this goes slack, that's disbelief. When somebody's doing that, she's got disbelief that he's accusing her of this. I see congruency in message and I don't see anything, any red flags here. Now, is she maybe a brilliant mastermind of a criminal who could walk past us all? Sure. Like, that's it. She could be smarter than all of us. That lack of emotion will make everybody jump to. She doesn't show grief. She doesn't show any of that. So she must be some mastermind that is outsmarting us. And in the comments, I'll bet you this is going to be one that gives us some volatility. This will be a good one. A piece in a newspaper about the case last week that ended by concluding that you're due for trial later this year. That will be, the piece said, when we learn just who the real Jasmine Harton is. Murderous Jezebel or a woman deeply wronged and set up for a fall by a vengeful dynasty. Yes, I saw that article. Um, I'm definitely not a murderer and I am being set up. I am, I, I really am. This is terrifying. I've only ever seen things like this happen in movies. Um, I'm literally trapped in a big unfair game, which is ironic because that's Michael's book where captive lions are tranquilized and then hunted. And I strongly can relate to that right now. It's such a small country. Everybody's terrified of them. Uh, they, they own the bank. They own the newspapers. They own the economy of this country. The commissioner's their best friend. The prime minister stays at Alaya Hotel in San Pedro. The problem you have with all this is, I mean, all of that may be true, as far as I know. I have no idea. Um, what is indisputable is that you fired the gun which killed this man. That's indisputable, isn't it? I was holding the firearm when it went off, so... Yeah, but, I mean, they don't fire themselves, do they? Like I said, it's dark. I'm trying to release the magazine. And just to let you know, so you mentioned a comment about the, the shotgun. That's a very different mechanism than a nine millimeter gun, which I'm not familiar with at all. So if my hand touched the trigger, it wasn't intentional and I didn't know it happened. My focus was, I wasn't even looking at Henry, I'm looking at the gun, trying to get the clip out so he could reload it so we could leave. Um, and I, I don't remember touching it, so I don't know how else to answer this same question. All right, well, let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we saw in 30 seconds or less. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, Piers Morgan, one of the greatest entertainers we've ever had out of the UK, but a very na naughty boy, very, very naughty boy. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so right here we see her drug usage, her behavior and how clean her behavior is, uh, her interest in the chief of police, 
all deceptive. I think there was some deception around those topics. Her knowledge of guns, I think there was some deception there. The nature of the message, I think there was some deception there. And you can tell all of this by unusual detail spikes. Go back through. Anytime there's a huge spike in detail that was not really relevant or necessary, big spike in detail, that's when those things happened. And I'm not convinced at all that she deliberately acted in any way whatsoever to harm Henry. Greg? Yeah, guys, if you go all the way back and we go back to baseline and we go baseline or eye movement when she's answering hard questions, when we go and find where she is hedging, we hear that long so in the very beginning. We don't hear that again when it gets to very difficult topics. We look for things that say, hey, I need time to think. We look for things that give me an opportunity. There's one anomaly, one anomaly. And it's when we're talking about her sitting so close behind Henry and how, why she was there. And she, uh uh-huh. And she does a very strong anomaly. My suggestion, my belief, my opinion is that there's something associated with what was going on before that she does not want to get entanglement with. And that's the only place I'd see deception. And I see it more as covering than I, and maybe omission than I see it as outright trying to be deceptive. But I would dig into there, given the right opportunity, I'd ask her a few questions around that. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of seeing someone who is innocent of doing something on purpose, but something horrible happened. And I think going back through this video and watching this and watching her behaviors, watching the way she talks, watching the way she approaches each one of these questions, I think there'd be a great lesson to uh, to to put in here. So when you're talking to someone, everyone's always looking for deception. And they're always, uh, no matter what happens, once you start getting into what we're doing, the first thing you think of is, are they lying? Are they lying to me? Or no, nobody ever says, let's see, what are we seeing truthful here? These are great examples of someone being truthful, even though there are some there's some deception in there about something else. And that's what's messing this up for. That's what's that's what's muddy in the water. And this may be a problem for her uh, when it comes to court. But hopefully they'll maybe they'll watch somebody from there will watch this and, and, and understand that we're seeing a, a blend of, of truth and deception, but the deception that she's talking about isn't that big a deal uh, when it comes to this, because she's talking about uh, going away forever or her life. I don't know how they handle those things over there. So, hey, Jim, are you still in there? Hey, you got a comment? This would be great. So what do you think? What do you got? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, backstage at the uh, behavior panel is a great place to be. I'm going to see you guys next week in Vegas. That's a greater place to be. (laughs) And uh, I'm very, very uh, excited and uh, very fortunate to have this opportunity and uh i agree with you guys i i understand everything you said i know what i felt and what i thought i saw and what i thought i thought but uh, it's always in the filter of the behavior panel and uh i've learned a lot i will always learn a lot from you guys and uh thanks for putting up with me that's well, I think we probably learned more from you than you've learned from us. I'll tell you that right now. And you're much better That's looking correct. than Greg. Much better looking. Uh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Your hair game is spot on, man. If I was half as handsome as Greg is, I'd be twice as handsome as I'm never going to be. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks, Jim. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Well, I think this is a good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. Good one. See you. So what do you got? I don't know why I don't know